Dr. Ranjit Peter, my postgraduate, many years back, but now a fantastic year on surgeon, ENT surgeon, for focusing on autology and doing a whole lot of everything else as well, and become a real force in Ernakulam. Um, my contemporaries asked me, how did Ranjit evolve into such a fine caliber surgeon? I said, we have to ask Ranjit himself. Because during the time that he was with us, of course, our facilities were quite rudimentary. But from that point on, he has become a force to reckon with amongst the several ENT surgeons in Ernakulam. I warmly welcome Dr. Ranjit to this August meeting. And uh, this program is being recorded. Later, the recording will be shared by everybody. Over to you, Dr. Ranjit. Thank you, Professor Devan. Uh, sir, my uh, dear teacher, as well as uh, a friend over, a, over, the, over you know, the period of time, I really am privileged to be able to do this uh, talk uh, on endoscopic middle anatomy and uh, surgery. And uh, I must also bring greetings from Kochi, uh, where I'm based from the Kinder Group of Hospitals, of which I'm a part of, and of course, from the International Working Group on endoscopic ear surgeons. And uh, I must also thank uh, uh, my teachers, uh, Dr. Professor Arun Patel, who, who inspired me uh, towards taking up endoscopic ear work way back in 2000. And uh, uh, other teachers, uh, renowned people like uh, Professor Geo from Brazil, uh, Professor Panetti, uh, Professor Daniele Marcioni and uh, Nirmal Patel. So, I really thank all the teachers, and of course, not to mention, not to forget Professor Tarabishi and uh, uh, and uh, the others. So, with that, I want to start off this talk, and uh, this is primarily meant uh, to be address the postgraduate students, the ENT postgraduate students at Asia Shetty. And of course, now the world is a small place with uh, online sharing available, and so I really thank and uh, thank everybody who is joining in. And I will focus primarily on applied aspects. I will not uh, dwell into too much of things that you can get directly from books. I will try and uh, you know, uh, focus on applied aspects. And this talk, I will very, very briefly introduce you to uh, at, least, at least the youngsters uh, to the, uh, the world of endoscopic ear surgery. And of course, we will focus uh, shortly, uh, we'll just briefly review the middle ear anatomy, endoscopic middle ear anatomy. And after that, I will be showing more of the anatomy in some of the surgical videos that I've, uh, uh, you know, edited from my own surgical, uh, you know, um, experience. So uh, after that, we'll try to uh, wind up with some question answers. And also, if time permits, we'll share a little bit about learning curve and how to go about a learning curve. I hope that will cover most of the things that are relevant for this talk. So uh, as we all know, uh, autologic surgery has, has uh, evolved a lot and uh, there's a wide interest that is ha that's happening in the world of autology, especially um, uh, in the area of endoscopic ear surgery. And it's very evident from the number of articles that have come in uh, over the recent past, over the past decade or a little more than that uh, in the area of endoscopic ear work. And it's a very rapidly developing innovative field and uh, which brings very positive results and uh, very desirable patient outcomes. Now, we all know that microscopic ear surgery has been the gold standard and it still remains a gold standard in uh, many places. And it no doubt has the uh, uh, big advantage of the binocular vision, depth perception, and the ability to use both hands and so on and so forth. But when you look at it from the patient point of view, it involves uh, the external incision, there is a lot of soft tissue retraction, and many times we drill uh, uh, large amounts of bone only for the sake of accommodating uh, ourselves to have a better vision of structures which are hidden in um, um, you know, recesses and pockets. Already gone the gap. And when it comes to endoscopes, we know the endoscope has the ability to go uh, beyond constrictions, natural constrictions, and able to give us an end-on view, a wild field view. You can see this in this, uh, for example, in this video, you can see the wide range of vision that is available with the stapes superstructure, inclusive joint, the stapedius tendon, the facial nerve, the ponticular pseudiculum, and, and all the promontory, the hypotympanic cells, everything visible in one single view. And that is a great advantage when it comes to endoscopic work. And so to enumerate the advantages, of course, we have a wide uh, angle of view. We have better visualization of structures. Many things which are hidden under the microscope become very much visible in the endoscope, with the endoscope. 
visualization of the deep recesses and hidden structures, many of the deep recesses, for example, sinus tympani or uh, sinus septipanicus and uh, several other deep recesses, or even for that matter, the uh, protympanum, all that becomes visible with the, with the uh, use of endoscopes. Yeah, and you can also visualize beyond the surgical instruments, which is another great advantage because with the microscope, you cannot, uh, many times the, the instrument may obscure the view. And it, you, you, technically speaking, you can address a wide range of uh, autological diseases, uh, uh, which are manageable using the endoscope. Okay, so as far as disadvantages go, generally we always speak about, uh, compared to the microscope, loss of depth perception and binocular vision. But then having said that with the to and fro movement and uh, you know, um, you are able to, uh, our mind is able to uh, gauge or reconstruct a 3D uh, feeling of the whole place and uh, assess the depth as well. And uh, inevitable one-handed surgical technique is many times a disadvantage, but then again, we do our sinus surgery with uh, using that. And so we are able to overcome that with proper uh, training and practice. Coming to need for strictly bloodless field. Now that is something again, just like sinus surgery, it is, it is very much, we can very much uh, manage in most conditions by proper, proper preparation of the patient, as well as certain anesthetic techniques and so on and so forth, which I'll probably share over the next few slides. Fogging and smearing an endoscope tip. This again is something that again, uh, there are tips and tricks for some of these things including shaving uh, or rather uh, trimming of the uh, external hair and so on, which, uh, which help in avoiding some of these uh, obstacles. Mandatory need for reliable surgical training. More and more training is becoming available, uh, specifically focused on endoscopic ear work. And uh, um, it, is, it, it is very much possible to get trained. Cost of equipment is sometimes said, but then again, you can, most of the work can be done with the regular ear set and regular uh, sinus endoscope. So that is uh, overcoming disadvantages. With that, I will uh, briefly uh, discuss the middle ear anatomy. And as we know, the middle ear, uh, the tympanic cavity anatomy uh, is divided into what is what lies medial to the pars tensa, which is the mesotympanum. And then you have the anterior aspect, the protympanum, the epitympanum above, the hypotympanum below, and the retrotympanum behind. And we will look into some of the endoscopic anatomy of of these structures. These are all taken from some of Professor Marcioni's uh, the, uh, textbook. And you, you know, we all know these structures, the ponticulus, which is a bony ridge connecting the uh, promontory to the pyramid. And uh, it separates, and this is the subiculum, which is uh, another ridge in the uh, retrotympanum. So to tell you for a fact, the retrotympanum is uh, the part which lies behind the mesotympanum. And of course, we'll talk about the boundaries a little later, but the structures are essentially divided into a medial aspect and a lateral aspect by the vertical segment of the facial nerve or rather the styloid eminence. And uh, a med on the middle aspect, you have the uh, uh, ponticulus and the subiculum. And uh, between the oval window or the foot radius tapis and the ponticulus, you have what is called as the posterior sinus. And between the uh, ponticulus and the subiculum, you have the sinus tympani. Another recess, is what is there below the subiculum and this structure called the funiculus, which is also sometimes referred to as the sustentaculum, um, uh, which, which is uh, the anterior limit, which forms the anterior limit of the retrotympanum inferiorly, and uh, which separates it from the hypotympanum, which, is, which lies anterior to the funiculus. So that is, those are some of the medial aspect thing, uh, uh, structures. Then you have the styloid complex, uh, which again, um, uh, represents uh, kind of almost the mid area of the retrotympanum. Uh, talking about the posterior sinus, sinus tympani, and sinus septympanicus, which I, I, which I talked about. The lateral aspect of the retrotympanum, you have again what is called the caudal ridge, and that divides the lateral aspect, or rather lateral to the mastoid segment of the uh, facial nerve, into facial sinus which the facial recess that we speak about in microscopic anatomy is when we approach from behind or posterior tympanotomy we do there. But in endoscopic anatomy, as you will see in some of the videos, uh, is a, it's a, just a light depression uh, which, uh, which forms a facial sinus. And then inferiorly, you have another recess called the lateral sinus. So these are the structures of the retrotympanum. Now, coming to the... Uh, variations of the ponticulus. Now there are variations 
uh, with the advent of endoscopic ana uh, anatomy, uh, we have several more um, uh, details uh, and vari variants uh, that have been studied extensively on caravers as well as uh, on uh, live uh, patients. And uh, some of the common variations are again subclassified into the ponticulus variations. You see the ponticulus when it's a full ridge uh, between separating the posterior sinus from the sub sinus sub uh, tympani, that is a type A. And when there is no ridge, it's called as the type B. And when it's, it forms just a bridge and there is a tunnel underneath that, it's called a type C uh, ponticulus. Similarly, when it comes to subiculum variations, when the subiculum is a full ridge, it's called type A. Uh, when it's a bridge uh, with the tunnel underneath, it's type B. And when there's no bridge, when there's no uh, prominent subiculum, it's called as type C. So these are all for the, uh, for, comes in handy when we are recording surgical findings and when, it, when you're doing a clinical audit, a surgical audit, and when you want to compare the structures of other matter, even sometimes when we are correlating radiologically. Next, the subpyramidal recess. Uh, the sinus tympani can extend uh, uh, deeper into the uh, uh, behind or rather medial to the uh, pyramid. And that is a subpyramidal recess. And type A is when it connects with the uh, posterior sinus. Type B is extension of uh, uh, sinus tympani a little more posteriorly. And type C is uh, extension of the, the, the subtympanic recess is not really from the sinus tympani. It's the posterior sinus, which is uh, deeper and goes into the, um, the subpyramidal recess. Similarly, uh, again, sinus tympani, type A, type B, type C, there is the, the uh, you know, depending on the depth in relation to the facial nerve, when it is uh, just about normal, um, uh, you know, angle, it's uh, type A. When it's a little deeper, it's type B. But when it's, oh, when it's going uh, posterior to the vertical segment of the facial nerve, or rather the facial nerve overhangs over the sinus, it's called type C. And like I said, you know, it is possible to, correlate that radiologically, the deep, uh, you can see the type C here, if, if my arrow, if the, my cursor is visible, you can see that. So coming to the epitympanum. Epitympanum, as I said, is the area which uh, lies superior to the mesotympanum, and it is uh, essentially formed by the pars flaccida, and of course, the lateral attic wall, or what we call the scutum, and medial to that, you have several structures, and uh, uh, the, the primarily being, of course, the Prusak space and the large, larger area, which is hidden behind the scutum is the, uh, is the epitympanum proper, wherein you have the head of the malleus, the body of incus, and of course, the, uh, sometimes there's a cog, there's a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the cog shortly. So uh, that is the epitympanum. And the epitympanum again is divided into anterior and posterior many times by, the, by a, another ridge of bone called the cog, which uh, kind of forms the fulcrum for the uh, temporal bone uh, roof. And uh, uh, sometimes the cog can be a little more anterior, wherein the anterior epitympanum is uh, almost missing and the boundary with the supertubal recess anteriorly. So these are some of the structures uh, in the epitympanum. Then, of course, coming to protympanum. So protympanum is the area which lies anterior to the mesotympanum, and its boundaries primarily uh, uh, formed by the anterior rim of the annulus uh, laterally, the Jacobson's nerve medially. I will be showing you some of the videos with the Jacobson's nerve being very clearly visible in some of the surgical videos. Um, the proteniculum. Proteniculum is another ridge of bone which separates the hypotympanum uh, from the uh, protein panel uh, inferiorly. And of course, superiorly, you have the, the, these structures that is a canal for tensor tympani and the supratubal recess. So these are the essential boundaries. Now, coming to protein panel, again, uh, there are uh, some configurations. Uh, when you have the uh, roof and the floor almost being equal, it comes into a quadrangular configuration when the floor is about uh, less than half of the uh, roof, then it's a triangular configuration. These are two configurations. And of course, we know that in the floor of the protein panel, we do have the carotid prominence, which may be dehiscent sometimes. And of course, deeper to that, you can see anteriorly, you can see the eustachian tube opening. And medial uh, or inferomedial to, or inferiorly and medial to the uh, tensor, um, canal for tensor tympani, 
we do have the subtensor recess. And again, there are configurations of that. You have when you have uh, hardly a subtensor recess, it's type A. Type B is a shallow uh, subtensor recess. I mean, it's a very deep subtensor recess. It's called type C. Again, the uh, this is again this is of the right here, mind you. So uh, there may be a little difference in orientation from the previous slides. This is of the right here, and in the right here, this is the floor we're speaking about. This is the medial aspect. This is the lateral aspect. So this is the <coughs> promontory. This is the proteniculum. This is the protympanum, and this is the hypotympanum. Now, when you have the proteniculum, which forms a barrier between hypotympanum and protympanum, it's uh, called type A. When it forms a bridge with a tunnel underneath, it's type B. And when there's hardly any proteniculum, it's called as type C. And now coming to the ventilation pathways, we all know that the, uh, the, uh, the attic is uh, ventilated uh, through primarily through the um, isthmus, which is, which, which is the uh, isthmus tympanicus, which, which is uh, uh, between the um, uh, process of and the um, and the tensor tympanic tendon and the uh, posterior incudal ligament actually and uh, that is again divided into anterior and posterior by the CP superstructure. So, but primer, primary ventilation happens between the tensor tympanic tendon and the CP superstructure, which is the main pathway for uh, ventilation. And there is also some which can go in through posterior to that, and some may even go anterior to this when the uh, tensor fold or tensor, there's a, there's a membrane which forms uh, mucosa fold there, the tensor fold. Most of the time, the tensor fold is, is uh, uh, complete. In other words, there is no hole or there's no perforation in the tensor fold. Just to orient you with this particular uh, image, this is an upside down image. That's, this is inferior, this is superior. You can see the post coccoliformis. This is the CP superstructure, pyramid the uh, uh, the shapidus tendon. So here we have the space between the uh, prosthococcal formis and the stapy superstructure. This is the area isthmus through which the main ventilation happens. And some can happen behind this as well, but very, very rarely, less than 25% of, uh, you know, um, uh, whatever studied um, um, specimens, generally find, we find a, a, a defect in the, in the tensor fold. And that sometimes forms another additional pathway of ventilation. So uh, having reviewed the anatomy uh, in, in, uh, very briefly, of course, I said we will be looking into the anatomy in, in, in live, I mean, in surgical uh, videos uh, in more detail. So uh, essentially we, we, we come to these, um, you know, when it comes to broadly speaking about endoscopic ear surgery and uh, ear surgery as such, you know, on one side we have totally microscopic ear surgery. This is, which is where we all start off with, whether it's residential training or whether it be, you know, early part of our practice. And then over a period of time, and uh, in fact, currently it's become the standard of care, wherein even when you're doing a, a mastoidectomy, for example, for cholesteroma, if you're doing a microscopic ear surgery, it is almost mandatory to use an endoscope and look into corners to see whether the clearance is uh, perfect or not. And then of course we have, uh, with practice, you come into microscope assisted endoscopic surgery, wherein, wherein we do almost entire work endoscopically, and then we use the mi mi microscope primarily for drilling purposes and wherever you need two hands as a, uh, as a mandatory use. And then on the other end, you have a totally endoscopic ear surgery, wherein you don't use the microscope at all, but then essentially all this, you know, which technique to use is dependent upon the pathology, and it is not a matter of uh, you know, um, um, uh, preference or uh, something like that. It's basically depends on the pathology and what kind of disease we're dealing with. And, uh, you know, uh, we decide what kind of tool to use. So coming to an initial uh, uh, demonstration of endoscopic myringotomy agromet insertion, you can see the superior view uh, offered by the endoscope. Uh, you can see the close uh, view of the tympanic membrane and uh, uh, the, the ease of uh, you know, manipulating instruments and so on and so forth. And I would encourage uh, you know, postgraduates, uh, even as a postgraduate, even, even I had uh, you know, uh, uh, the introduction to, to uh, endoscopic gear work was when the microscope was occupied by the cleft palate program. And uh, you know, there was 
by the by the main operating you know senior surgeons at that time as I, when I was a resident in Belgaum and um, um, you know the cleft palate uh, program you know they, they, there was a need for um, for uh, merigotomies and so uh, endoscope is very handy and you can do that this is another teacher this is another child with an with a cleft palate um, uh, who had adenoids so we cleared the adenoids and this patient also had incidentally had a um, previous grommet done elsewhere. And so when the patient came to me, I, I said, it's better to place a T-tube, so which is a long lasting tube. And um, uh, in, in fact, I don't have the post, uh, post uh, follow-up uh, video of this, but uh, it, it, was, uh, it was, you know, the tympanic membrane in fact had uh, reco recovered completely. All the retraction was gone and even the thickness had improved over a period of one month. Next, I'll come to a, uh, a video of uh, a tympanoplasty type one using tracheal perichondrium. And I must say that uh, the principles are essentially the same. However, as you can see, there is this uh, uh, muck here, which is basically the biofilms and uh, uh, dried up secretions. And you can see a, a small central perforation in the anterior inferior quadrant. So here I am placing a cotton in the exonteric canal prior to uh, washing and cleaning all the all the uh, biofilms. After cleaning, then we do the infiltration. Uh, infiltration is essentially as against generally the four quarter infiltration that we usually do for uh, microscopic work. Many times endoscopic ear surgery we can manage with just infiltration in the uh, in the uh, posterior superior aspect wherein the entire canal becomes blanched with uh, the um, local anesthetic bar saline. So um, I usually use 2% xylocaine with adrenaline, the prepared solution, which is one in two lakhs. I know there are different uh, views on that. Uh, different people use one in 80,000. Some people use um, uh, one in 100,000. Uh, I'm generally happy with the one in 200,000. And, uh, um, and of course, um, after waiting for some time, and essentially during this time, I usually use take the time to trim the hair, which sometimes uh, can, can be a reason for repeated smearing of the endoscope tip. So after this, uh, as we would do with uh, regular microscopic work, uh, trimming the edges, trimming all the edges of the uh, perforation, And this has to be meticulously done, as we know that uh, the fibrous uh, uh, ring at the edge of the perforation is the reason many times for the permanent perforation. So it is important to uh, lose, uh, you know, to make that fresh. And then after you remove the uh, quadrant by quadrant of the perforation, you must um, ensure that the entire rim is free and taken off. And after doing that, remove the rim. Sorry. I'm fast forwarding in between. And after removing the rim, the next step, of course, is, is elevating the tympanometal flap. So, I've, and of course, I've, uh, I'm freshening the undersurface of the tympanic membrane. And then with that, uh, raise the tip of the middle flap. Now, generally, in, in this kind of situation, the anterior perforations, um, it's always better to assess the, uh, you know, there is something called the fisheye effect, wherein sometimes when we use the endoscope, the depth perception sometimes becomes a little um, over-assessed, if I may call it that way. So uh, it's always good to have an idea with the, uh, with the you know, the tip of your elevator uh, you know, uh, the distance between uh, how, how much of a distance you want to take from the annulus. And in this particular case, I am raising a flap from about two o'clock to about, um, uh, say, uh, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and uh, elevating the flap. And even the elevation part. Now, this is a, this is a suction incorporated instrument, but I must tell you that when you're using, um, you know, you're waiting for about five minutes, uh, using the time, I'm talking about after infiltration, when we're using the time um, uh, for the trimming of hair and waiting, waiting for the anesthesia to act or the uh, constriction to act, 
uh, it, it, the bleeding is relatively minimal, I must say. And then you, uh, the, the common mistake done is going in too fast and uh, that will cause more bleeding. And of course, again, with adrenaline cotton ball, you are able to uh, control uh, the, the, the bleeding. And even while elevating the flap, it's a very, very, uh, I must say a pleasurable experience. You know, you, you, can, you can have a very close view of the, uh, of the flap elevation. And uh, when you're going, I've been talking about learning curve, many times it's, it's a good idea to just do step by step. You can even uh, consider just elevating the flap and then doing the rest afterwards with the microscope. You can see the close up view that you get um, uh, with, the, uh, with the endoscope. You can see the annulus there, the uh, middle uh, mucosa medial to that. And uh, see, I'm elevating from all around inferior to anterior. So, you can see the annulus being elevated all around. And even the anterior recess, I'll fast for a little bit. Even from the anterior recess, you can see the elevation from the anterior recess as well. See the close-up view of the anterior recess. Many of these areas are generally hidden when we, when we use the microscope, but you can notice that with the endoscope, the, the, uh, even the area like the anterior recess is very, very much visible and you can see every millimeter of the structures or rather uh, what you're elevating. And then using a Rosen's pick, I'm uh, elevating the, you know, um, uh, making a puncture into the middle of mucosa and elevating the tympanometer flap. And this, uh, and you can see the uh, corda tympani there. Okay, and then the whole thing is lifted up like a bonnet and you park it uh, superiorly, some blood in the middle here uh, from the, you know, tr the uh, freshening of the margins done earlier. So removing all that blood. You can see again, see as soon as you open, you can see all the structures with one single view. You can see the uh, posterior crust of the stapes, the stapedus tendon, facial nerve, uh, the pyramidal eminence, uh, ponticulus, the round window niche, all that. And then so you elevate the entire thing and park it up. So elevating the entire flap, uh, temporal flap and parking it superiorly. And uh, so after you have elevated that and parked it superiorly, you, you are able to see, you can see this is a stipulous, um, the handle of malleus. And you can see the entire, all the structures. In fact, see, you can see the anterior and posterior crust of the stapes, the posterior sinus, ponticulus, um, uh, incurocipital joint, uh, lenticular process, the stapedius tendon, pyramidal eminence. Uh, this is the vertical uh, segment of the facial nerve. Uh, you can see even the, um, uh, the Jacobson's nerve here, for example. Look at the Jacobson's nerve, the protympanum, the hypotympanum, protoniculum, all the structures being seen so well in one single frame um, without doing anything much. And so it becomes, it increases our confidence. See, even you can see the prostacocleiformis here, um, prostacocleiformis with the tensor tendon and all that. It's everything is visible so clearly. Uh, only thing I must say is when you do all this, yeah, the lighting is important. Uh, the general recommendation is to use the minimum lighting required and always less than 50% of the light that, uh, you know, uh, of the end of the uh, the cold light source you can see the jacobson's nerve so clearly you know you can see the jacobson's nerve and the branches coming out of the tympanic plexus so all this becomes very very clear and this is the sinus this is the sinus tympani here you can see the um, ponticulus forming a complete ridge and that was the facial ridge so these are some of the structures that you see and uh, and you can you know you can uh, this is a harvested uh, tracheal perichondrium in this particular case, I'm using tracheal perichondrium. By default, generally, uh, for large central or subtotal perforations, I use thinned out tracheal cartilage with perichondrium um, when it comes to, uh, you know, um, um, temporoplasty. So uh, again, here it's uh, you, you can assess the uh, ossicular mobility and uh, intactness of the ossicular chain and everything that you need to. It's very much uh, very easy to do that with with vision. So here I'm placing the graft and parking uh, you know, anteriorly on the walls. And in fact, it will be draping all around on the walls so that it is uh, stable. And uh, once it is draped, the TM flap is placed back 
and you get a good uh, complete uh, closure of the uh, perforation. And then after that, uh, you know, uh, smearing out any, any air pockets under the flap. And once we do that, you place gel foam. Again, you can always elevate and see whether your park is, uh, whether your parked uh, graft is stable. And once all that is done, park back as usual and place gel foam. And the, the biggest thing about this is, you know, the patient has very, very minimal pain post-operatively because all you have actual incision is the tragal incision the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the graft. And again, there is no other external incision anywhere else. In fact, the tragal incision, I don't even suture because I have done suturing initially in my initial experience and I found the scar is more if you suture. And if you don't suture, it's such a small incision, uh, it heals off almost completely scarless. And um, um, so the patient essentially has just an autovic and a little uh, medicated uh, gauze in the external canal and nothing else. And uh, uh, there is no mastoid bandage, nothing of any kind. So that is that. And placing the gel foam. Coming to the next endoscopic stepidotomy. Now this is uh, again uh, something which uh, you know, uh, which uh, this is a 38 year old male, a left ear moderate conductive hearing loss with a Carhartt's notch, and you can see the infiltration being done. And in the next video, few videos, I'll probably skip the uh, the uh, the infiltration and TM flap elevation. Even if some blebs form, there's nothing of concern because the blebs. Uh, you know, you can just puncture it and it, it should be sufficient. But the important thing is getting a good uh, avascular uh, elevation with the infiltrate going even up to the mid layer so that you can elevate the flap very, very uh, smoothly. This is uh, two percent xylocaine with uh, adrenaline prepared, pre-prepared solution, not, um, uh, not anything extraordinary. And uh, uh, after that, of course, uh, elevating the flap in this particular case, it is from... Sorry, I think somebody's uh, mic is on. Um, so here I'm elevating again the flap from about um, um, uh, um, 10 o'clock to uh, six o'clock. And uh, uh, once you do that, fast forwarding that, elevating the flap, you do come across the tympano squamous um, uh, uh, mastoid suture lines and Again, all that can be separated quite straightforward. Reaching up to the annulus, elevating the flap, getting into the mid layer with the Rosen's needle, fast forwarding that, the corda tympani coming into view. And as soon as you elevate, you can already see but still having done all this, even though you can see everything, it is important to uh, cure it out, the posterior superior uh, bone, uh, primarily because it helps with instrumentation, you know, uh, because your um, uh, forceps and other uh, uh, instruments, even while placing the piston, we need this, ang this area to be free, even though you have complete visualization, you need that, ang that, that area to be free for instruments to go in a straight line. So that is the only reason why we cure it out the bone. And here again, you can see all the structures that we mentioned, the facial nerve, the, the uh, ponticulus, the posterior sinus, uh, the sinus tympani, sinus subtympanicus, subiculum, uh, funiculus, uh, and hypotympanic air cells, Jacobson's nerve, everything is seen very well. And after that, like we do, we check the ossicular mobility by uh, uh, pushing the, first of all, of course, the malleus, and then of course, the CPC head as well. And I must uh, uh, reiterate that you know the always the mobility is always checked from posterior to anterior direction, just in case there is some mobility, uh, because the sepidus tendon will hold it in place. So never from anterior to posterior, always from posterior to anterior. And here I'm uh, in separating the uh, incurosepular joint. Uh, I didn't use a right angle pick. I use a variety of instruments like you know uh, <laughs> like a sickle knife and sometimes uh, just a curved pick. And uh, after that, after the um, um, separation, 
um, curating out the bone from the posterior uh, superior aspect. At this point, it is uh, important to be careful with the cauda tympani, but sometimes, uh, you know, the bone around, in some, some patients, the bone around the cauda tympani may be very, very strong. And sometimes you may end up a little, uh, you know, sorry, you may end up, um, um, you know, uh, damaging or sometimes sacrificing the cauda tympani, depending on pathology. But generally, you are able to preserve it uh, in most patients. So after removing the post, curating the posterior superior quadrant, even before separating the, uh, the uh, uh, rather doing the crurotomy, I generally, it's my practice to, to uh, make the fenestra in the posterior aspect of the foot plate, which is very much visible there. So you can see exactly where you're going. You have a vision of the facial nerve. You, we have all, everything very well seen. And making the next size, there's usually a, um, um, done in the posterior aspect, or rather the junction of the middle and the posterior aspect of the um, uh, foot plate. And after that, once the fenestra has been made, I section the uh, sepidus tendon. There are different techniques of doing this. There's uh, straightforward first sectioning, then followed by uh, you know, removal of uh, superstructure. There's so many techniques available. This is uh, what I follow. So uh, fracturing the superstructure by giving a gentle tap many times, or even you can use other uh, instruments to you know, uh, fracture and it fractures off quite easily. And after that, with the fenestra very clearly visible, next is measuring from the medial aspect of the I've been using the measuring jig. Again, looking at all the structures there. And that was actually the superstructure, which is there. I'm removing that with the sepidus tendon, removing the entire thing. And after that, we measure from the uh, medial aspect of the uh, incus to the uh, foot plate. And then cut the piston. Generally about 4.5 is the average uh, length that I usually use. I mean, again, it depends on the measurement, but on an average 4.5 and I use the 0.5 mm piston. Generally this works well for me. So after placement of the piston, After placement of the piston, we crimp it. And uh, I generally ask the anesthetist to draw some blood, the patient's own blood, and then apply some blood and then checking the tugging and the tugging and pulling test, you know, checking whether it is engaged fully in the, in the fenestra. And after that, I generally apply some patient's own blood in the uh, area of the, uh, of the uh, foot plate. So applying blood there and then suction off the rest of the blood, applying blood and then uh, removing the blood. And this, I found that this blood forms a good seal uh, and uh, generally patients don't complain of any vertigo uh, whenever I've used the blood seal. Formerly I used to use fat, but currently I use blood. And uh, after that, placing back the uh, temp uh, temporal middle flap. And then of course, um, uh, I mean, in my experience, uh, sepidotomy, almost all patients have done well uh, with uh, good airborne uh, closure. And then we just again place the gel foam as usual. Coming to the next, uh, this is a limited cholesterol, a 16 year old boy uh, with a right ear chronic otitis media, squamous type with mild conductive hearing loss. And uh, he had presented with some right ear ache. And uh, there was essentially a grade four retraction pocket in the posterior superior quadrant. And then coming to the radiology, it's, it's important to, to check the radiology in all these patients. There's some superior to inferior, superior canal, the, um, the master air cells, 
the lateral canal, lateral sensor canal, ice cream cone, hourglass. You can see some soft tissue shadow medial to the uh, incus. And you can see inferiorly as well, retraction of the tympanic membrane. These are axial cuts, as you can see. And that is that. And this is the, this is the coronal cuts from the uh, TMJ. As you go posteriorly, you can see uh, the uh, soft tissue shadow middle to the malleus and the retraction pocket. And the master air cells are fairly clean with just some mucosal edema. So these are the radiological findings. Now coming to the operative, operative videos. So you can see uh, the, there's a retraction pocket uh, in the posterior superior quadrant. I'm suctioning, and generally I do a lot of irrigation for all uh, all ear surgeries. You can see the adherent head of uh, adherent, uh, um, uh, you know, past tensa on the head of the stapes. Doing some suctioning with the curved instruments, flushing, and so on and so forth. And once the flushing is done. Uh, and of course, I also, I think I missed the infiltration part. Infiltration, this is the infiltration, sorry. You can see the infiltration going all along. And after infiltration, just put a cotton ball inside and then um, start trimming the hair. Trimming of hair is a very, very important step, which is actually a tip for, uh, you know, avoiding uh, smudging of the endoscope tip. So make sure it is, it is trimmed well. And that time is well used time because that is time for the local anesthetic and uh, you know uh, the adrenaline to act. So once that is done, raising a temporal middle flap. In this particular situation, this is right here for, uh, for that matter. So I would raise a flap from somewhere around, uh, say, uh, uh, one o'clock or two o'clock to posteriorly, uh, posterior inferiorly or uh, anterior inferiorly about uh, uh, four o'clock. So elevating the flap. This is a sixteen-year-old boy. You can see the elevation of the annulus and you can see the cholestoma directly coming into view, the cholestoma sac or the retraction pocket. The uh, cauda tympani there. Oh, oh, sorry. This is elevating from the, um, uh, you know, the scrotum area. And this is a, uh, you know, pulling down the, the tympanic membrane from the lateral process of malleus. Yeah, so that is that. And it's very important that when you're dealing with uh, limited retraction pockets or cholestomas, not to be greedy to get rid of the cholestoma in the first shot. It is important to, import, uh, to uh, improve your exposure uh, all around so that you can you can peel off the cholestoma sac in total. Just like we deal with endoscopic skull base work or with endoscopic uh, you know, sinus tumors and so on, it's important to make sufficient space for us to, uh, to deal with the entire cholestoma sac rather than taking it piecemeal. So um, you can see that I've exposed this much. And I know very well that the incurostipular incus lung process is already eroded, so I can be confident about manipulations here. So exposing the entire area and slowly, gently peeling off an exposure, exposure of the cholestoma sac from inferiorly, posteriorly, and so on and so forth. Peeling it off from the cauda tympani. Of course, in this particular case, I would uh, generally cholestomas, I would sacrifice the cardiac nipana because that sometimes can otherwise harbor residual epithelial tissue. You can see the peeling off from the, this is a cholestoma involving the retro and the hypotympanum, by the way. And uh, I, I think I didn't show you on the radiology, but uh, slightly uh, higher jugular bulb with, uh, with uh, cholestoma draping over the jugular bulb. You will see all that. After that, I'm, I'm still not dealing with the cholestoma fully. I'm, I'm doing the uh, aticotomy. Um, I'm uh, cur curating the bone, uh, posterior superior, as well as the uh, uh, scutum, so as to enable me to see 
the incredible, malleoincredible joint as well as the body of the incus. And I must say, uh, when we're dealing with endoscopic cholestoma, it is a good practice to remove the incus so that, and of course, uh, most of the time, the head of the malleus as well, uh, after you know, uh, fracturing the, uh, using a malleus nipper, uh, the neck of the malleus, uh, remove the um, uh, head of the malleus as well as the uh, body of incus so that the entire epitin panel becomes free and visible so that we can deal with the entire pathology. Here I am removing some mucus. These are mucosal folds in the epitin panel. And you can see the malleoincral joint coming into view. Curating some more. Still not being greedy for the cholestoma. Uh oh, sorry. No, sorry, this is another one. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, this is the one which we are watching. Right, so and uh, separating the incredible sepidal joint, I'm sorry, malleo incredible joint. And peeling off again cholesterol medial to that. Not trying to remove the cholesterol, peeling it off gently. And peeling it off from the Stepe superstructure. And now removing the incus body or remnant of the incus. Only the long process of the incus was eroded. Okay, and then you can see the cholesterol sac being fully visible. Peeling off the entire thing. Sometimes a good practice to place back the flap so that you have an orientation and then again re elevate the flap so that you have a good orientation of the flap and you don't miss out on medial aspect, lateral aspect, all that. You can see the gently peeling off from the sinus, uh, from actually the, yeah. So this is, uh, this is the incus. So, I mean, this is the So, elevating from the stepe superstructure and the stepe tendon. Gently peeling off, elevating from the, again, not my direction of force, it's from posterior to anterior, not anterior to posterior, otherwise you'll cause SN loss. Gently peeling off again. And wherever you need to, you know, cut tissues, uh, you can dissect additions. You can see the entire thing is peeling off nicely. The entire thing coming off. From inferior aspect, like I mentioned about the hypotypanic, you can see some bleeding now from the jugular bulb. It's draped on the jugular bulb. A very thin plate of bone there. And as I elevate, there's some fresh bleeding. I mean, uh, I'll go a little faster because I think for time's sake. So uh, there was some bleeding and then so, See, there's nothing of concern because even if there's bleeding, just like you would do with uh, any other procedure, place some gel foam, wait for some time and the bleeding will be controlled. And uh, after that, elevating the whole thing and removing the entire cholesterol sac in total. So he was able to remove the entire thing. And even after removal, you can see the entire contents, all the structures. You can see the adherent area, all that can be cleared. In fact, there is some addition on the round window membrane as well. Elevating further, this is the, uh, 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 the funiculus, elevating the funiculus. So that is that. 
clear, clearing the entire thing. And see, the important thing is you can see the entire thing. And protein panel is absolutely free. And even the anti panam and all that is completely free. You can see the prosococlid formis with the uh, tensor tendon. You can see the entire, all the structures. You can see the, um, the see this is Jacobson's nerve, the, uh, sorry. The tensor tendon, all the structures. So after everything is cleared, placing, uh, of course, we always have a look into the um, uh, aditus and the antrum with an angle scope. After that, placing a refashioned incus, drill out the incus because incus also can harbor sometimes epithelium. So uh, using a refashioned incus as the interposition graft on the sapis head and then putting a palisade cartilage Again, tracheal cartilage graft with perichondrium to reconstruct the uh, attic as well as over, as a palisade over the uh, the stapes, uh, the incus assembly and place back the graft. So that is that, and then this is the post-op um, result. You can see. This is a post op I think it's about one and a half months post op You can see the cartilage graft sitting in place, attic in place, and the rest of the tympanic membrane intact. And the patient is doing well. He's under follow-up almost, I think, two years now. This is another uh, case, which I think I'll be using as the last case. Uh, I do have a facial neuroma, but I think I'll skip that. So uh, this is another a patient with, uh, a recent patient with, uh, 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 I think a 38 year old lady with a limited uh, retrotympanic cholestoma uh, with a mild to moderate conductive hearing loss. And you can see in the axial cuts from superior to inferior lateral sensory canal, the ice cream cone, uh, some soft tissue shadow, medial and posterior and retraction pocket there, you can see that. And coming to the, um, the uh, coronal cuts, you can see again, the malleus, the retraction pocket there, lateral tympanum. We'll just go ahead. This is the sagittal cut. You can see medial to lateral. So this is the uh, endoscopic picture. Flushing nicely, flushing all the biofilms and uh, all the debris. Underwater flushing, you can see the cholestoma sac there with the attic perforation and some granulation. Suctioning it out. Again, same thing. Do infiltration. Infiltrating. Elevation of the tympanical flap, again, about say from um, um, about one o'clock or two o'clock to uh, about uh, four o'clock or five o'clock. Elevation. Some blebs, but nothing of concern with the blebs. Elevating the flap, I'll skip the elevation part. Seeing the cholestoma sac, medial to the TM flap, cordate tympani there, cordate tympani is engulfed again. Removing the entire thing from superiorly as well. It's important to denude the entire uh, scutum area <clears throat> and the uh, uh, superior aspect of the, I mean, from the lateral process of malleus and so on and so forth. And uh, once you do that, you can see the cholestoma sac coming into view with a very clear mesotympanum, is totally free. You can see the handle of malleus, nothing happening anterior to that. And here again, I know that the incrustapular joint is, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, eroded. So I can be free with manipulation of structures. This is again, mucosal folds superiorly. You can see the uh, malleoincral joint. Suctioning out the entire cholestoma sac in total. And you can see again, see now everything. Fast forward. Yeah, the entire thing coming off. 
the cholesterol is out. Okay, here was the video. There's a part where the cholesterol is completely out. And you can inspect the entire cavity. You can see the lateral sinus canal, facial nerve, the uh, superior tendon, superstructure, some uh, addition to the um, the uh, stapes, uh, superstructure, I mean, um, uh, head of stapes, clearing off everything and removing the incus. And you can see again, Jacobson's nerve here, Jacobson's nerve, stapes superstructure, suctioning off uh, from the uh, posterior uh, posterior sinus. And uh, this is the Larson canal bulge, facial nerve, prosocochliformis. Looking at using and trying to look if there's anything in the stapes arch with an angled instrument. It's only blood I've suctioned off afterwards and then it's clear. This is with the angle scope looking into the aditus Larson canal. Very clearly, nothing happening there. All clear. The cog there anteriorly. Looking into the protein panel, this is the shape, uh, tensor, tensor tympani tendon. Jacobson's nerve, which forms the boundary again for the protein panel anterior to that. Inspecting the entire area. Then placing a cartilage, uh, tragal cartilage again refashioned tracheal cartilage, placing it over the incus as an inter uh, over the stapes as an interposition. And then over that, a palisade, placing that over that, placing a palisade um, cartilage with, uh, with the attic reconstruction and pedicondrium there, and placing back the flap. And this patient again had good hearing improvement. Facing all the delphi. You see, mind you, even the, all these patients, they go home with just a canal autovic. That's it. And this is the post op, about two months post op. You can see the entire uh, posterior uh, or posterior aspect of the uh, uh, past tensa as well as attic fully intact. And the audiogram. This is the pre-op audiogram showing a moderate, a mild to moderate conductive hearing loss. And of course, at uh, four kilohertz also, but uh, notice the 500,000 and 2000 shows good closure uh, at about 30 to 40 decibels, 30 decibels, 35 decibels. So that is good closure considering the pathology of the, uh, of the, uh, this thing, of the pathology of cholesterol. I have one more video of facial neuroma, which I will probably skip. This was another, this is actually done combined. Uh, there's a facial neuroma involving the um, horizontal as well as the vertical segment. I'll just skip. I'll just show you the intraoperative findings. This is the from the uh, from the uh, horizontal segment, the neuroma, and uh, in this, of course, I again did uh, fracturing of the uh, uh, removing of the malleus head so as to access that entire area. In fact, this particular case, I had I removed a circumferential uh, TM. Uh, you know. Um, the entire uh, circumferentially and was placed back later, which did well. And then drilling and so on and so forth. I'll, I'll skip through this because I think there's no time. And uh, uh, I did a post auricular approach as well. And then um, denuded the whole thing, removed the entire up to the normal nerve. And then after that, you see a greater auricular nerve. See this entire nerve, uh, facial nerve segment, neuroma segment removed and placed a Great auricular nerve graft with temporalis fascia on the proximal and distal ends and supported with gel foam and then closed. And this patient, uh, of course, uh, as we can expect, uh, facial nerve function is poor. Uh, about uh, now it's about, I think, three years post op, three, almost three and a half years. And he's about grade four to gra grade four uh, House Brackman uh, function. Uh, with uh, physiotherapy and so on and so forth. So that is that. Now, uh, ideal endoscopic candidates always go for limited disease uh, with no evidence of infection. And if there's infection, of course, prepare uh, the infection with antibiotics and uh, suction clearance and all that. Wide canal and um, uh, even congenital cholestomas are uh, good, um, um, uh, you know, because it peels off very well. Acquired cholestoma with minim minimal mastoid disease, minimal inflammation of the middle ear, Anesthesia, again, excessive bleeding uh, can be frustrating. So it's very important to handle that with reverse standard position, total interveners anesthesia or hypotensive anesthesia, 
with the heart rate around 50. Um, uh, infiltration, again, you can use your own choice of infiltration, but generally uh, one in 100,000 or one in 80,000 is preferred. I use one in 200,000, which works okay for me. Uh, you can see the important thing is after infiltration, with that single infiltration, you are able to achieve complete blanching and uh, it should go up to the mid layer uh, when you infiltrate. And uh, uh, wait for five minutes, that time can be used for trimming of hair, which is not time wasted. Uh, you can use adrenaline cotton balls with the full strength, that is one in thousand adrenaline. Uh, remember the, uh, you know, ergonomics is important. Generally, a head neutral position with neither too high or not neither too uh, looking down. I usually do all my surgery sitting down, um, but standing or sitting both can be uh, used as a technique. Uh, microscope, uh, whenever it's likely to be used, you, it's better to do a sitting position so that you don't have to keep changing. Right handed surgeon always go for the left ear. Uh, adjustable armrests are important because armrests give you stability. Endoscope holders is not recommended for uh, beginners because it reduces the uh, available space uh, in the canal. And there is, uh, of course, uh, a risk of ossicular injury if the patient moves, risk of significant heat transfer. These are not my recommendations, it is uh, literature. Uh, recommendation, uh, it's not recommended for beginners. And of course, cholesteroma, when you're dealing with practically all cholesteromas can be dealt with, which is not infiltrative type. Uh, but uh, if it is be extending beyond the lateral sinus canal posterior edge, then of course it's better, it's uh, mandatory to go ahead and do at least a canal wall up mastectomy and you can always see the clearance. If you're happy with the clearance, you can maintain a canal wall up. If you're not happy, uh, with the infiltrative matrix, it's better to do a canal wall down mastectomy. So it again depends on the uh, on the pathology, and of course, stenosis ear canal. It's again contraindication. So common mistakes are poor bleeding management and trauma to the ear canal with angle scopes. Um, the uh, understanding of limitations of the equipment. You must know what the instruments you have, and they, uh, you know you may need angle instruments for special situations. Short tympanometer flap. I told you about the fisheye effect. Failing to convert earlier to mastoidectomy, if you spend too much time, it's better to convert to mastoidectomy. It's important to slow down and add time to the operating list. Uh, start in a deliberate manner with wide canals, uninflamed pathology, pick idle cases to start like, you know, um, um, small central perforations or even uh, uh, limited cholesteromas. Uh, and radiological Im imaging assessment is important. Spend time trimming the hair. Uh, the hair. And, uh, have microscope at least for your initial uh, first 10 to 20 cases, it's better to have microscope. And of course, wherever you need, you expect drilling, it's better to have the microscope. Avoid 45 and 70 degree scopes when starting. Don't give up too early. And most uh, uh, surgical failures uh, happen within the tympanic cavity. And so, you know, it is uh, important that we see everything that we are dealing with. Superior visibility is everything. And I, I like this statement by Professor Marcioni, uh, which speaks about the tool must never determine the surgical attitude, but rather the pathology must uh, decide what kind of tool we use. And it's all in, of course, in the best interest of the patient for best outcome and uh, so on. And I must also share some important resources. It's good if you can, ha if you're interested to get hold of uh, Professor Daniel, Daniel M. Marcioni's book. And of course, there's a lot of uh, resources available from the Sydney Endoscopic Ear Group, as well as the IWGES uh, Group um, website. So if there are any questions, I will take that. Uh, and uh, I think I have overridden the time by almost 15 minutes. Sorry about that. I thought I could finish in half an hour. I did practice, but then I don't know. So anybody has yeah, any questions, Ranjit, you can ask yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Ranjit, my voice is clear? Yes, it's clear, sir. Ranjit, I can't believe it is my PG who is doing such work, my former PG, you are so outstanding and incredible. You know, there are two blessings in life to be beaten by your student and to be beaten by your children are the great two blessings one can ever expect. And in that regard, you stand tall, towering over others and your work is simply unbelievable. I can't even imagine the, the, the work that you're doing, absolutely fantastic. Two things, number one, uh, the uh, you always use an adult endoscope, isn't it? Would you ever use a pediatric endoscope? Yeah, or an I, I do have. I do have. Uh, I do have. Thank you. Sir. Thank you very much sir, for the compliments. I must say it's all God's grace uh, that I, 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 I manage most of God's the cases. God's grace and uh, teacher's blessing. God's <laughs> grace and. <laughs> 
Um, so so uh, to answer, answer your question, yes, uh, I do generally use the adult endoscope because it gives a very wide uh, range of wide uh, angle of view. Uh, however, I do have the 2.7 mm pediatric uh, zero degree scope as well. Uh, and uh, adult endoscope, I generally use the zero as well as the 30 degree endoscope uh, uh, when it comes to cholesterol and so on. Uh, but then um, uh, I do use once in a while, uh, you know, uh, it's very tempting to look into the uh, middle ear closer vision and so on and so forth without injuring uh, the canal. So I do use the uh, pediatric scope to have very, very close up view. For example, some of the, some of the, um, you know, uh, the visuals of um, the uh, retro tympanum or rather the tensor tympanum tendon and so on is with the uh, pediatric scope, which is, which also offers a good, a close up view. So I use the pediatric scope once in a while, but generally most of the work is done with adult endoscope, yes. And the, the images are so clear. You, how did you record this? Which camera was it? And, so the standard, uh, standard stores, uh, three chip camera, uh, not the spice or anything of that kind. It's the standard <laughs> HD camera. Oh, so nice. And yeah. the third thing is, you know, I find when I infiltrate, it becomes a mess. It becomes such amount of blanching and the whole um, thing is a gooey. But your work is so meticulous and clean. How, how did you achieve that? So I think the trick is to, uh, inf I use a 26 gauge needle. I use a short yeah. needle. I don't use a long needle. I use a 26 gauge short needle that is half inch needle in a two cc yeah. syringe. And uh, yeah. my infiltration uh, starts off not in the canal. It's a little more lateral than what you would classically use in in uh, microscopic yes. work, a little more lateral, postural lateral uh, in the skin yeah. area, not in the, uh, more lateral than you would think. I think you saw in the video. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and then hit the bone and then uh, slowly elevate, I mean, slowly infiltrate. So you can see the entire blanching in the vascular strip as well as it yeah. uh, spreads over the entire canal. And it must also enter the mid layer. That is the thing. Yeah. And uh, after the infiltration, I wait for a good five minutes. In fact, I don't look at the time because I, I generally spend that time uh, trimming the hair, which is generally about three to four minutes at least. So uh, yeah. that gives good uh, uh, you know, uh, time for the infiltration to act. I generally don't ask for hypotensive anesthesia for these cases because um, yeah. the normal anesthesia seems to work well. And, uh, yeah. uh, I, I, and I, I, I also have the luxury of uh, the, uh, the uh, suction incorporated elevator, Panetti, Panetti, Spiegel and Thais, uh, elevators. Uh, so uh, that is a luxury, but I do, I have done enough and more even without. For example, I go to Mandalay and operate earlier. Uh, so uh, there I, I used to do everything without, uh, without any specialized instruments. So I do regular uh, work with that. You, you go to, where did you say? Mandalay, Myanmar. Myanmar? Yeah. Burma? Yes. <laughs> wow. Tell, tell us, I've seen you in the initial presentation with various luminaries around the world. Can you tell us where you have gone? Oh, that is all in India. So I haven't actually, uh, all the luminaries when they visited India, I, I made it a point to attend almost all the webinars Beautiful. and seminars and, uh, you know, all the workshops that are there whenever they come yeah. down. Um, so it's all in India, Patna, Bangalore, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yes. I find, I mean, you are using the, the uh, curate. Would you have ever used uh, diamond drill? Yeah, I see. In fact, I have. I have many more videos which I have not shared because of limitation of time. But then, see, there are a lot yeah. of tricks that you can do. Um, um, generally, I picked up this trick from uh, Professor Arun Patel, uh, wherein uh, you you put in the, uh, the the orange color suction catheter, you know the suction catheter, the orange color suction catheter. You cut it, and that goes in as a shield for the burr. So oh. the only the tip rotates; the rest of it is uh, protected. So the the flap is protected. So that is one trick. The other trick is, of course, uh, you can always convert it to endoral incision. And uh, using the end oral incision area for the drilling, it gives you wider access for drilling. Uh, then uh, there are other tricks, for example, for the scutum, especially in such cases where you know the incurostapital joint is already you know, uh, non-existent. Um, you can use even a kerosene sponge to uh, remove the uh, scutum. Uh, it comes out well with a good kerosene sponge. Of course, all this is under vision, under close, uh, you know, uh, uh, vision of the uh, foot plate and steppies and all that. So that is, those are some of the tricks. 
the way you remove that entire cholestatoma sac it looks like a tiny fetus coming out of the the whole nice small little baby coming out it is so beautiful and delicate and wonderfully done yes uh, sir the whole thing is uh, uh, see most cholestomas are uh, see i'm talking about limited cholestomas most cholestomas even if it's going up to the um, mastoid for that matter um, if it is a good sac uh, you know it can be done endoscopically uh, for uh, like i said you can always convert uh, do it inside out technique with an endoral incision and um, uh, it will come off very well because you are you're not being greedy for the cholestoma you're peeling it off gently looking at the margins and peeling it off gently so if you try to remove the cholestoma piecemeal it's going to be a big mess no doubt yeah one uh, pg question be harassed you with is enumerate the conditions in which you will leave cholestoma behind um uh, see the, the uh, on the foot plate and other things yeah 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 so so i i do have in fact i i don't i have some other videos wherein um, the, uh, the you know the cholestoma is complete the stapes superstructure is completely absent and uh, only the foot plate area you know the uh, is completely absent but you are able to peel it off number one even uh, lateral submissal canal fistula for example um, you are able to uh, peel it off gently of course provided the membranous labyrinth is intact and um, um, provided we don't have a perilymph gusher kind of a situation uh, even perilymph gusher i haven't had a perilymph gusher so far but uh, you know there are people who who manage perilymph gusher also endoscopically so technically speaking uh, uh, the only uh, leaving behind um, in my opinion endoscopically with such good vision is when you have the infiltrative kind of matrix uh, some cholestomas are very infiltrative with very cellular mastoid wherein you cannot be 100% sure that uh, there is no cholestoma left behind in some of the uh, small air cells and it's not possible to clear up the entire thing because such a cellular mastoid so in such situations i would um, go ahead and do a canal wall down mastoidectomy um, and i must say in the past uh, you know uh, um, say 4 uh, years that i have been here in uh, cochin um i have only done a handful of canal wall down mastoidectomies because most of it almost all of it can be managed endoscopically and that makes a difference to the patient and so in that regard you know there was a pg at the paper of geo sasaki from the university of kyoto who developed a cholestoma solvent when you force to leave a matrix behind he said just put the solvent it will dissolve only cholestoma and you can suck it out when i told that to our former friend dr madhavia he said margaya that is the end of our career <laughs> but you would <laughs> yeah uh, but, but you are you know cochin is uh, you know you are surrounded by you know ter terrible people i must say it's not a nice thing to say but in, you have made a trail mark and left a trail behind you know you have uh, you have brazen through a forest and left a trail behind a luminary it was so fantastic to see this sort of work happening in cochin so um, it's very addictive sir i must say it's very addictive because yeah. this kind of work once you get into it there's no turning back and then uh, yeah. when it comes to microscope you know you 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 you, you yes. use it only for master master uh, drilling basically yeah i saw you cut the stapedal tendon but that i suppose uh, some uh, reports of the the um, functioning of the tapes tendon is lost post epidectomy so in that regard there is a fluoroplastic piston in which the tendon is reattached back to the uh, piston in order that they get the stapedal reflex back any experience with that no sir absolutely not was a fluoroplastic piston okay okay so uh, well uh, you know this has uh, evoked such a response across india many hods professors pgs have logged in so if, if those who are on the group many came and left because working time but anyhow those who are on the group if there is a open house if you want to ask ranjit you will not get a chance to talk to him so directly with such a luminary is there anybody who would like to ask any questions he is there because on my personal mm -hmm. request ranjit has so nicely and so kindly sort of agreed complied to be on this forum uh, dr ranjit yes sir uh, this is dr shanmugam here I want to approach guys from Dr. Devan sir. Yes, uh, Shanmugam is our another former PG Ranjit, and he's uh, yes, yes, I think he's my senior. Yes, yes, I, I know. Yeah, Dr. yeah. Yes. Uh, well, yes. I just want to know most of your most of your surgeries. I saw it was done on the GA. 
Are That's you right. attempted doing that local anesthesia? What is your what is your comfort? No, to? I have only done. I uh, know. See, uh, local anesthesia I have not done simply because um, uh, you know um, nowadays almost everything is done at GA. Uh, only meringotomy, grommets, and T tubes and all that I have done under local and um, uh, endoscopic work. Other than that, uh, mid midlia work uh, I, I didn't uh, get an opportunity to do under local yet. And I think mm -hmm. I'm quite comfortable with GA. Yeah. <laughs> so Shanmogam, may I ask you a question, please? Please, sir. Shanmogam, the problem is one day in KMC Vijay, when I was operating halfway through under local, the local anesthesia wore off and the patient yeah. started screaming yeah. and would not allow me further injection. The anesthesiologist refused to give GA because they said they are not prepared. Yeah. How will you yeah. handle such a scenario? No, uh, sir, you, you, you plan your surgery. I, well, I was just asking Peter uh, Ranjit, sir, uh, whether for limited uh, small corporations or T-plastics, not for mastoidectomy, for T-plastics, maybe you can try local anesthesia. But yeah, T-plastics only, because... but halfway through the anesthesia thing, I don't know whether the old stock or what happened, the thing wore off and the patient simply would not allow me to inject. I had cut open the ear, graft is prepared, and she started screaming. I yeah, Ranjit or Shanmugam, how do you handle such a situation? So you have to have good relationship with the anesthetist, so that's the only, only solution. <laughs> you remember, um, Ambresh was the anesthesiologist and he said, I'm, <laughs> he said, I was, I'm not, uh, and I refuse to give because I think she has had a food or something. Anyhow, I'll tell you, Ranjit, I mean, uh, Shanmugam, how I manage. Uh, ketamine, you can use ketamine, sir. You can ask anesthetist to inject, give ketamine or proper form. These two things maybe, uh -huh. these two yeah. things maybe you can uh, use without uh, giving diet GA because already your patient is draped. Again, uh, yes. intubating, intubating the patient is going to be difficult. You can request yeah, yeah. to use ketamine or propofol. These two things or metazolam. These three things can be used. Sir. They could have done that, but they refused. Anyhow, what I did was I hypnotized the patient on the table. I take about half an hour's time. And under hypnosis, <laughs> under hypnosis, <laughs> I completely say, no, why I brought in this, both uh, Ranjit and Shanmugam, next month I am going for advanced hypnotic training in Mumbai. If both of you are interested, join me along. This guy okay. teaches you instant hypnosis. Oh, I really? had a demo in my department. He came to my department, looked at my one faculty member, just waved his hand. He instantly got hypnotized and fell down. Oh. Yeah. So, so uh, because that earlier next, episode... Next, uh, uh, the thing, sir, in your um, armor room, sir, you have uh, gone through a lot yeah. of things. Uh, you have diversified you're from ENT to a lot of other activities also. Sir. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So, uh, both of you, you know, next month, May... We are going for the three-day advanced hypnosis course. If you uh, would like to come, please join us. Yes, yeah, so hopefully the COVID yeah. will come down by COVID will come down by the time. Yeah, I hope. I really <laughs> hope. Any, yeah. any other you, question, Dr. Peter, very nice, you. very nice demo, sir. Thank you. Very nice, very nice. Any other questions, you. please? Any other questions? Ranjit, uh, this uh, scope that you use is it Hawk or uh, Stores or what is it? No, stores, stores, stores. Now, stores, many people ask right. me if we have the money to buy only one endoscope, which would you prefer? And I would say always buy a wide-angle 45. Any experience with a wide-angle 45? Uh, I've, I've used a uh, 45 degree, but not for endoscopic ear work because uh, generally uh, adult 45 degree scope uh, many times can cause, um, you know, uh, first of all, the uh, the area that you want to look at is something like the additors and uh, that, that kind of area. And uh, it may yeah. traumatize the exonotic canal. I have used, however, I have used in uh, like endoral incision and all that, I've used a chameleon scope, the stores chameleon scope, which gives you up to, I think, uh, uh, 120 degrees. Um, so that is for just looking into the mastoid. Uh, that was in Brunei, of course. I don't have the luxury here. Yes, yes. So one more, one more question, Dr. Peter. Yes, sir. Uh, you said your instruments were with uh, uh, with the suction uh, suction incorporated. How do, how, right. do you, how do you how do you control your uh, suction pressure? Um, see, yeah, there I is a yeah. So there is a hole. Uh, there is a hole in the you know just like all other suction. You know you have the the uh, release mechanism, isn't it? So. You can uh, leave it open, and when you when you uh, you know block that, the suction works. So that's uh, the Panetti instruments, and, and uh, of course there are so many Indian instruments also available. Okay. Um, so uh, you know uh, that's not an issue because uh, that that works out well, uh, just like you would have with the suction adapter for uh, the regular uh, micro suction. 
the penetrating instrument also has a, you know has a well has a what do you call the the vent or the hole <laughs> thank you sir is that clear yeah yeah is thank you thank you thank you yeah it was so nice in the beginning, you know, you showed various classifications of subiculum, ponticulus, and various middle year architecture. I was wondering where to get that to teach my post, yes. but I have recorded the entire thing and I will be sharing it across India, Ranjit. So those, th thank you, sir. Th th those, uh, you see, those anatomical uh, uh, dissection video, I mean, the uh, photographs are taken uh, from the Sydney Endoscopic Ear Group uh, uh, Dissection Manual. And uh, that is freely available for download. You can actually go up to the Sydney Endoscopic, just Google Sydney Endoscopic Ear Group, um, and then you can access their resources. There are a lot of resources. In fact, you go on YouTube and look at the Sydney Endoscopic, uh, uh, you know, the group's um, um, uh, anatomic dissection videos. There are about six, six videos, uh, five, five minute videos, which are, which are really uh, something that I uh, refresh myself with every time I go in for a, uh, for a so just purely for the, uh, you know, academic sake. So some Absolutely of those details are fantastic. very well dissected out in the cadaveric uh, videos on the Sydney, Sydney Endoscopic Year Group. Dr. Professor Nir Nirmal Patel. I mean, I can search it for on a Google and it will throw up, maybe. Yeah, it will show up. Sydney and in fact, you can get a lot more resources in the IWGES uh, website. Just Google, uh, Google uh, you know, International Working Group Endoscopic Ear Surgery. And uh, they have a lot of uh, links um, to the work done by different people. I plan to put up mine as well. I've enrolled myself as a member of the IWGES. So I, I plan to put up my work also. I'm still... Uh, gathering. See, my videos are not perfect. I still have. I still have to incorporate post-op uh, audiograms and post-op uh, videos. So I'm just trying to get all that so that I can put up a proper thing when I put it up online. But they are pretty good, Ranjit. Pretty I, good. I, I still need to incorporate a lot of audiograms, post-op yeah, audiograms. Yeah. I need to yes, incorporate. Yes, yes. I must inform. I don't know whether Arun Naziz was your batchmate or senior. Arun Naziz from was Australia. My junior. He Ah, and uh, somehow we got him into, and he did get into the Melbourne uh, virtual dissection program right. where he had a haptic touch and he would feed the CTs and all that. He used to send me videos on virtual uh, temple bone dissections. Mm -hmm. So recently there was one from, from Korea, from Seoul, Korea, there was a virtual dissection course. Uh, these are difficult times, but once I, I suppose, if and when the, uh, the corona settles down, I, you are going to come down to my place and demonstrate these techniques to my pose. I have 11 of them, Ranjit. God willing, God willing. <laughs> yeah. Any other queries, please? But otherwise, uh, Neha has lifted a hand. Yeah, Neha from Mumbai. Neha does fantastic uh, uh, RF work. You know, she by through a radio frequency needle, Shanmugam, I suppose you must pick up the talent, through a radio frequency needle without an incision, she completely involutes the thyroid gland. What a wonder and a miracle. Yeah. Neha has that, lived. Can I please that is, call that on is Neha? That is in thing now, RFA, RF, uh, radio frequency yeah. ablation of thyroid nodules, yes. Yeah, super it is. Yeah, please, Dr. Neha, I see you have lifted your hand. Thank you, sir. Sir, actually, I just wanted to show across, share a small experience, not too much, actually. But uh, we've used this kind of a smaller endoscope. I think I'll need to switch on the video for that or something. Uh, yeah, so smaller sure. length endoscope. So it's very cumbersome. I mean, it's very handy to use. The distance between the eye and the lower end of the scope is far less. So it's easier for the ocular axis as such. I mean, sir may be able to reason out it's far better in a manner to use it for uh, at least minor surgeries in the outpatients, say endoscopic uh, myringotomy or endoscopic aspiration from the middle ear or uh, such procedures per se. Is there, a, is there a picture that you can show us? Yeah, I, I, I have the hand. Yes, I have the scope at hand. You know? I mean, wow, this is a yeah. home setup for the moment. This is so a home far. setup, but uh, a very small endoscope. The working length is less, which is from the eyepiece to the end of the scope is less. So, so it's easier to kind of gauge uh, gauge regarding the... No, we can't see your video. Is that, a, is that an auto endoscope or is it a different, uh, something unique? It's, it's an endoscope. It's an auto endoscope. It's a small length endoscope in short. Just like Where how did you pick it up from? Uh, it's a Shenda make. It's not actually any of store. I have rest of all uh, Heinz or yeah. 
but this is a kind of a, that you know the chinese or that kind of thing but the walking length is very less so it's easier to use it and it's uh, peaceful to the eyes i think so so i may be able to explain more better as to what is the reason for a smaller ocular lens uh, endoscope you know the working lens from the eyepiece to the end of the scope is less so it's very easier to gauge the distance and to maneuver our various instruments while doing endoscopic ear surgery the light so, loses xenon or the routine and sorry? there's a xenon overheat the lens yes 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 it can be used with any any of the light source or uh, any of yes. the light source even a portable light source which we use so that we can use it for a icu patient in yes. the past because it's a portable light source also which can be used along with this so yes a any other question that please. portable light source with a small endoscope you know, small uh, working lens thank you doctor you can see the, dr neha small uh, working lens yes uh, uh, th thank you for that uh, now the only uh, i mean it may be good in the opd but you know generally uh, when we do endoscopic ear work um, yes. it's always good to have a little longer scope uh, so as to not clash with the length of your instruments because otherwise you know when you are uh, for auto endoscopy purpose it may be good uh, and i'm sure it's very handy uh, but when it comes to endoscopic ear work mm -hmm. uh, it's always better to have a little longer you know like the regular sinus uh, length yes, sinus yes. endoscopic length so so as it doesn't clash with the length of your uh, you know the forceps or for the micro forceps or whatever it may be using um, there's a tendency for um, the short scope to clash with the uh, instruments so that is one thing that i would uh, make as an i mean you know as from my experience i i did uh, have the choice of using a short i mean auto endoscope uh, initially to start with but then i uh, this is uh, i found this is the same same thing shared by most same opinion shared by most people who do endoscopic mm -hmm. ear work um but yes. however having said that yes of course um, uh, it's it's good i i know of my some of my friends who use um, uh, a short scope even for nasal endoscopy for that matter you know? yes yes we, i mean multipurpose use and outpatients it could have been handy just as a discussion yes. point not anything else as such. yeah yeah, yeah. And, thank uh, you dr neha sure. any other questions sure. please go to talk thank you so much thank you any other questions fantastic presentation ranjit sir shweta here thank you dr shweta pleasure any other questions thank you everybody thank you especially to dr ranjit you know on my request so nicely all his videos he has shared with us um it was an honor sir it was really really something uh, you know uh, i'm i'm Oh, I'm, I'm happy to be able to share whatever I have, and I'll be happy to share anything more that I have. So I'm sure we yeah. have time constraints, you, but then I think there are can, uh, several other videos in the offing. But I suppose we'll fix another day according to your convenience, and we'll have one more meet, Doctor Anjit. Sure, sure. Anytime you say. We'll Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjit. Have a great day. And Thank may you, Thank you both of us may both of us make plenty of money. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sharma. Thank, 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 you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Sir. Bye bye. Thank you very much.